Um, hi, I'm Mariko, and that's my Twitter handle. Um, I am a textile JavaScript engineer at a company called Scripto. I organize a local JavaScript user group in Brooklyn, New York called Brooklyn.js. Um, today, I want to talk about my feelings on language, both on English language and the coding language. So I learned English as an adult. Like 10 years ago, I was never would have thought that I was speaking English at a conference standing here. Um, I was pretty bad at English, and um, but I got around with it. I wanted to go to college in, uh, in US, so I got into this like six month ESL program. Um, I learned somehow, I graduated from the college, so now I do okay job, I think, but for you to judge. Uh, I also learned to code as an adult, Maybe four years, four and a half years ago, I decided to pick up and code. I was always in tech industry as a project manager, but I was never a programmer. Um, I decided to teach myself code. And intersection of those, code and English, having those two as adult learner and then second language for your profession and for your speaking language, I got a lot of feelings, mostly <laughs> frustrated feelings. <laughs> Right, so like uh, when I saw the CFP for this, I was like, I got the feeling about this, I'm gonna submit this. <laughs> so much like many of the people who started to, or teach themselves learn uh, code, past five years, I started to learning code by using online tutorials. There, that was offered in English, I got through tutorials, I made a little web apps, and I learned like, you know, concepts like function and arguments and valuables, and I got that, like I got like what it does. But then like I was like always curious about like why is it called function, why is it called valuables? Because when I started learning to code four years ago, I was already somewhat fluent in English. And um, in English, the speaking English, you don't speak like, oh, it's too small. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. You don't speak like this, like, oh, I'm thirsty, so I'm gonna call a function called the go to store, and here's my arguments because I'm thirsty, I need a water, and here's my $5, give me water. Like, that's not a language. Like, I was like having a hard time calling these three things arguments, and like, still the constant fear of like, if I go to technical interview, I might call this parameters, and they might think that I'm not a proficient in uh, JavaScript, because those are called arguments. Um, and then like, I somehow got through that, and then I got a job, and it was Node, and Node required me to do this like, terminal thing, and people says like, oh no, you should read a document, and like, you know, notice that I was doing, the, I started doing Node at 10 and 25, so like, I'm still new, but like, still, like, it wasn't quite the good documentation, and go in there, and I'm like, why is this thing in square buckets? I don't really understand. Uh, what's callback? Oh, is it a function? Why, what? So like, that was like maybe like fifth, six, seventh months of my, me doing the JavaScript. So I turned to my native language. I Googled it in Node and filtered it on the Google saying like only Japanese and found a fantastic blog post. The title says the Node.js, recommendation for Node.js for front-end engineers. And they break down like what the callback is, you may try this in try catch, but that doesn't work with node because undefined defines, and then this here's how you um, handle the error, which is this part. And then like they have like commenting on the code and like I got to understand it. So now I was like, this is awesome. Learning things in my native language helped me a lot. And I got me, got me through building an app. I got accepted to talk at conferences. Um, so I was like really interested in like offering help for open source projects and those online tutorials saying, writing to them saying like, hey, I really like your tutorials. Like, can I translate this because it's highly beneficial if it was offered in my native language and I think there's the other people out there who would benefit from it. I would donate my time. Um, often um, end up in not getting any response. Sometimes, like three weeks later, um, template support reply comes back saying like, thank you for your email. We have no plan of expanding the business to the Japan, but you know, thank you. And I'm like, I wasn't really pitching you to bring a business to Japan. I was just asking to translate it because I'm not even living in Japan. Oh, by the way, I live in New York, so. Um, I wasn't talking about a locality of things. 
But, you know, you got through, you learned it, you got comfortable with it, you make friends in the community, here's the meetup that I organize. Um, a lot of people, I talk about stuff and come to a conference and meet more people. Then I find myself in between these things called opinions because we are opinionated. So one example of opinion talk that I was like, really, this is do it, like are we doing this, was, um, have you all uh, familiar with the term isomorphic, isomorphic JavaScript? So as far as I understand, <laughs> that is a part of, uh, a code that lands on both on server and client. And calling that as isomorphic was kind of buzzy word around May this year. And people were like talking about like, no, isomorphic is not, a, a, it's a misused word, you should really call it portable. Or like, it's just a flashy math word, doesn't mean anything. Or it's just a new semicolons. <laughs> and I'm like, really? Like, oh. Uh, like, if you told me now, as an adult learner who's like still learning, like, no, this thing that lands on server and client is called isomorphic. I don't doubt that isom where the isomorphic word comes from. It is registered in my brain. That's the isomorphic. So I'm like, cut me some slack, like, you know. And I had like a few of those experiences about like the hardest pro problem in programming, uh, programming, which is naming things and like wording of things. And then also I realized that the platform that we use isn't really equipped to talk about those like different non-English folks, like something like this. So um, Lamzi Yasser created the la programming language entirely done in Arabic. And he created the repo name in Arabic. And GitHub made that repo name, which he entered in Arabic, into dash, dash, dash. So if you go to his project, it is slash and answer slash dash, 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 right? So I was like curious. So I was like, okay, let's try that. And I found this. Okay, let's enlarge it. So I put a my repo name, which came back with green check mark, accept it, because it's Unicode character, maybe. But then once you hover off from that um, field, you get this pop-up saying your new repository will be created as Dash. And to me, this is like, you know, you know, as a, a Unicode character, it is acceptable, but like we don't know what to do with your language, so like we just kind of replace it with Dash. But like my language has like so many characters and you know, translating that into Dash is kind of like, you know, really? <laughs> so, I had a series of those things. And not just these two things, that doesn't fit in this like 15 minutes, but I have a series of those things. And I came to have this thing that I thought that the tech is freaking Anglo-centric. And I don't even know what Anglo-centric means exactly, <laughs> but seems to be the fitting word. And from my experience, we, we just have to deal with it because we are not gonna speak Esperanto each other suddenly and then solve all this problem. We, like, it is the thing. Like, it's not just having a majority of the community being um, white and male. It's that the language, even the language that we use is very, very Anglo-Saxon centric. So I had a lot of frustration and feelings and thinkings, but this year I had a positive experience related to this. And that is a IOJS um, I18N or localized or global. We honestly don't know what to call. Here's another language problem. Uh, but basically IOJS offered up for a speaker or the, the user of different, um, a language that is not English to contribute to translate a website into their native language, to contribute to run a social media site. So in February 7th, Michael Lodger puts out an issue saying, you know, anybody who want to participate, just plus one on this issue and we'll create a working group for you. So remember my experience of like, you know, asking them like, hey, can I offer you to volunteer to translate? I was like immediately, yes, somebody finally is giving me a chance to do this because I always wanted to contribute. Like I may be a beginner JavaScript person, but like I'm a native JavaScript, uh, Japanese speaker. So that's like the, the best language that I use, right? So I quickly um, plus one for Japanese, I got added. I started translating documents and websites and, you know, learning the um, Twitter handles. 
And later, Michael asked me to help um, adding a new users, including new repos. So that's why I came more um, having a more insight into what's going on and how many languages created, and that's why I submitted a talk here. Um, so two things Michael did, or Michael or IOJS group did uh, really well was that when you created the new language group, it came with one issue called welcome. And here's a list of things you do. So when um, interests are high and people are excited, there's a list of things that they do so that they don't really need to wonder or argue about like where to start. There was a clear start with like, there's a three blog post that I want you to uh, translate or and then create this um, social media account, whatever fits your culture, it doesn't have to be Slack, blog doesn't have to be medium, whatever fits your culture and users, just create and do your own thing. So I was part of the Japanese working group that and we created our own Slack. And this is a screencast from one of our member being nominated to be a node collaborator. And then we were just kind of you know, celebrating and talking about like having sushi and things. So in, at the end, 34 teams were created. And here's a list of languages. And um, out of those 34 teams, 23 became active groups, active meaning not just plus one and somebody has a repo access and the working group access. Um, these languages in yellow have actually started learning their own social media, um, translated some documents. To be honest, after a few weeks to a few months, most of them kind of dim down after the excitement goes out and you know, a lot of complicated moving parts things with IOJS and Node.js happens, um, but few teams are still actively doing the, the thing that they started in February. So here's an example of a Korean group um, just created the issue on creating a documentation translated, uh, the 4.1.1 documentation translated to a Korean. Um, Taiwanese group somehow picked up interest in translating NPM weekly. Look at this, um, it, oh, you might not be able to see it, but um, 13 days ago they have like a through of issue coming in, and they actually have a translated version on the issue, so they're actively working on it. The Turkish ha group has been uh, constantly working on it, um, translating the blog post that the Evangelism Working Group publishes, and they're discussing translating the new Node.js org website. Um, not only those three, like I'm part of the Japanese group and our GitHub activities are not so high, but we are, the, the Node.js user group in Japan is organizing a conference in November, they have very active Slack, and that's the thing too, like once we created those teams, um, some team moved the conversation off of GitHub repo, so, and then it is offered in different languages that I don't speak, so I can't really track down like what exactly happening within those 34 teams that we created. But one thing we definitely had was that the, we encouraged each other to participate. Like from Japanese working group, one member became part of a technical community TSC, one member became a collaborator status, and he's part of two working group, diversity and evangelism. And we look at like, oh, Taiwanese group is doing that, maybe we should do this. And we kind of like encourage each other. But those are the people who would never have contributed to IOJS or Node.js if that was the issue wasn't there to say like widely open, welcome, right? Um, and then you might be thinking like that's great, great, great. Like I would like I would love to do that in my project, but like I can't really take that much of work because it is a lot of work, and that's why Michael Rogers asked me to help him do that. Um, and that's totally legit. That's totally fair. But experience this. Um, my experience um, get, got me like few insights into you can take care now without taking not much of an effort. And this is an effort that you can put on your project, not only to help a people with a non-native English speaker, but also everybody. The first thing is let it simple. Um, as a non-native English speaker, reading English is like just parsing a code. Like if that comes in the big chunk of the thing, it takes up your memory and it takes long time to process. But if let's break it down with TLDR, so like kind of load map of like how this two paragraph um, article is going to be, or in bullet points, it's much easier and much faster to understand. And I, I think it also applies to native speakers too. 
Um, the other thing is set policy and licenses. Um, you know, my experience of like asking them like, hey, can I do this translation? Maybe they had no idea what that meant. And having that set first will help you. One example is that the another open source project called Fudi. Fudi has a very extensive contributed, uh, contributors guide. One of them are give talks. They already have a key, two keynote slides made. And up there, everybody can browse. And if they decided to give a conference talk or meetup talk, then they can contact them to give that talk. The other thing is improving accessibility. And going back to parsing a paragraph, do you agree that this is hard to read? It's extremely hard for me to read a comment on Haku News with this tiny font and this contrast. Um, I find it, it's very easy to read um, the style in Git, how GitHub renders the markdown file. I find it that the, the contrast of the letters in background and link and uh, spacing, um, somehow reading on GitHub is much easier than anywhere else. One other thing is that make it in text and don't do this um, wacky CSS on highlighting stuff. Here's how I read English. Remember I said I parsed a text and I learned the, the English as kind of like a code like grammar. I go line by line, highlighting, one by one going to read it and trying to match with the glamour in my head to understand this. So I noticed this recently. I was reading this beautiful data visualization that was in one giant image, and I could not not highlight it, and I could not read it, and I kept moving the image, and I realized that, oh, that's how I read English. Um, and having that in accessible text helps to be able to lead it by screen readers, and screen readers are tremendous help. I did entire online tutorial with help of screen readers because I could not get hang of just reading the line and getting the concept. It was much easier when it was coming from my ear. And the other thing is mind the gap. So you all are fami maybe familiar with this, looks good to me plus one, ship it. But I wasn't really familiar with the idea of LGTM up until a year ago when I first saw it at a job. And still, I don't know why we use this scroll. And quite frankly, I don't know what this is and I don't know why we call it ship it to merge code or deploy something. So like, you know, different people, different background have questions. And the last thing is maybe sometimes it helps to talk about those feelings. Node.js hosted a collaborator summit, an in-person unconference in San Francisco in August, and they flew uh, collaborators all over the world to come meet in person and talk about how they run the project. Um, the notes from those meetings are available, publicly available on Google and uh, Google Docs. And one note from um, this paragraph mentions that like um, the collaborators from outside the, the US saying like, you know, those um, Google Hangout meetings, we need you to speak slowly. Or uh, notes like written communication is easier for me to understand than being done by speaking. So having uh, those um, conversation might not be on your agenda for your technical community meeting, but it helps to land project, project every now, now and then to talk about that. So just a summary of five points that I put it up there now. And if you are interested in this topic and want to know more or want to understand like how non-native English speakers experience this journey, then I uh, highly, highly recommend watching this uh, talk from GDC by Lani Ishmael called How Language Creates the Largest Invisible Minority for Games. And in this talk, he tells you how to read Arabic and how it is using game development. It's fantastic 30 minutes you can spend. Or maybe you're interested in like, you know, putting in the, somebody's shoes and trying to learn language in different language other than English. Uh, in that case, you have FeakerScript, which lets you write a JavaScript in Swedish. 
Um, and then maybe you want to be completely away from using alphanumeric letters. You can use language called Nadeshiko, which is a programming language that's been around for 10 years and quite a large community around it uh, is there in Japan. And this is the documentation part of uh, explaining if else statement. It's completely done in English, uh, Japanese. And if you go in there, you can experience this complete lostness and you know not understanding anything part of learning to code in your second language. So those are, links are in the slide. I have a few thank you to put in. Um, Aria, who is like super excited that she's here. Um, probably Aria is the only person who, when I subtweet or frustrated tweet, like, you know, entertain my conversation on tweet. Um, Michael and Jeremiah, who is in a uh, core, Node core team, uh, gave me a lot of insight into what happened at these, uh, Collaborator Summit and what's going on with CSC. Um, a company that I work for, the Todd, Lucy, and Rob, who probably the best Anglo Saxon male boss that I can ask for. <laughs> super supportive. Super supportive. I cannot thank you more. And uh, Tracy and Amanda, who are both conference organizers, who entertained my idea of, you know, I'm thinking about giving this talk and making this, and um, they helped me have chat with me and, you know, submit to the conferences. So my slides are up online. Uh, that's my Twitter handle. If you have any questions, I'm happy to chat. Thank you very much.